Hello and welcome to Sunshine for Your Life. I'm going to tell you a story to begin with that involves me and it occurred a few years ago uh, when it was like, I don't know how many years ago, but quite a few years ago, I sustained a very serious back injury. And the way that I got it was that I had I bought a book that promised that if you did the exercises in the book for six weeks, it would make you strong like an Olympian. Well, I didn't really believe I'd be strong like an Olympian but I thought it would make me stronger and that I would be healthier. And what I didn't know at the time was the fact that I had uh, an abnormality in my back that I was born with. I had an extra bone that normally wouldn't be there, and it was kind of like in the Cossack area, but it was kind of halfway between a vertebrae and a Cossack. And I didn't know I had it. I'd never had real back problems. No one had ever x-rayed it. But there it sat. Every so often, a person is born with that kind of an extra bone that's really not supposed to be there. So I'm doing all of these exercises, and what that bone does is make your back very unstable. And I didn't know it at the time, of course. So my unstable back went through some incredible exercises, and I got a really, really bad injury from it. My doctor said he'd never seen anything like it except in, in football players. It was that bad. And of course, the pain was actually pretty incredible. So I, uh, what I did was uh, I had to be out of work for a few weeks because I couldn't walk right. And the doctor who treated me uh, uh, treated me like three times a week for the first year. So for the first year, I went to the doctor three times a week for treatment. And uh, then it, it phased down to two times a week. And then it phased down to once a week. And I'm still getting some treatment for it even today, although my back usually feels pretty well. Now, when I went in for treatment, there was an elderly man. He was always taken second, and I was always taken first. And he got really ticked off about that. And as I would go in for my treatment, he would be sitting there waiting to be called in. And I would hear him mutter, I wished I was first. Why can't I be first? It's about time I was first. And I could hear him talking. I knew what he was saying. I could hear what he was saying. And he went on and on and on with it. Every single uh, Monday, since my appointments were Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, he had a Monday appointment. He was always second. I was always first. So I listened to this every single Monday. I wished I was first. Why can't I be first? Somebody else is always first. And he was elderly. He wasn't having any pain. He was retired. He didn't have any set schedule, so it really wasn't important that he be first. And I was about to tell the doctor, if you want to take him first, take him first. I can wait. However, the doctor wanted me in first, so I went. Uh, and what happened was one day it got the better of him, and he rolled his, he got so angry, he rolled his jacket. He had a light uh, spring jacket on. He rolled it up into a ball. And as he was rolling it up in a tight knit ball, and that he actually took it and threw it and hit the receptionist with it. And he did it deliberately. He tossed it like it was a ball, and I figured he can't have too much pain to be able to throw like that. But he hit the receptionist, and that's what he intended to do. All the while he's screaming, I want to be first. I want to be first. Why can't I be first? I should be first. It's about time I was first. And he screamed like that and those phrases over and over and over again. Meanwhile, she was trying to be polite, trying to calm him down, but this is very, very inappropriate behavior at a doctor's office. So I decided to let the doctor know about it because he was getting more verbal, more agitated, and more physical. And who knows what he would have done next. He might have gone and hit her or something with his fist. So when I went into the doctor, I told him what happened. And I said, I don't know if you really want to know this, but I think you should know this. And I explained what happened. And uh, he said, I'm going to have a talk with that man. And if he's not willing to come in second, then he can find himself 
another doctor. And I never saw him after that, and I think what happened was the doctor dismissed him. Well, it got me thinking. He wanted to be first. It was him. Him, him, over anybody else, over anyone who had pain, over anybody else's schedule, he wanted to be first. And it was very, very egocentric. And a lot of people are egocentric. But, you know, if you're serving God, God comes first and you come second. But God looks at it as if you're so important that he's willing to be in you to do his work through you. Nonetheless, the Bible does say, he must increase and I must decrease. Now, the, the saying, I must uh, he must increase and I must decrease, comes from a Bible verse. Because uh, when John was living and Jesus was, li was living on this earth, people were asking John, why are people going to Jesus more than they're following you? The people were following John, and he predicted Jesus coming. But then... Jesus had a lot of followers, and people were following him instead of John. So his disciples asked him about it, and he said, I must decrease. He must increase, but I must decrease. In other words, Jesus always comes first. He was a disciple. He was important. But Jesus is the king of kings. He's most important. So that's what he was saying. There is a, a Bible verse. I'm going to read it to you from the NIV. It's John 3.3. And it says, he must become greater, I must become less. He must increase, but I must decrease. And what it's saying is the same thing as what the King James would say. He must increase, but I must decrease. God is the one who is the most important, all-powerful God. Um, and another verse I'm going to read to you is John 3.21. I'm reading it to you from the NIV. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. Everything that we do, if we're Christians, we do it through God. The Bible does say that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And what that means is that God actually lives in us. The Holy Spirit actually lives in us. And because of that, God is doing his work through us. As I've said before, and I'll probably repeat it again. It's not like an employer employee relationship where God says, I need this done, do it. I'd like to have you do something else, do it, and give you instructions. It is God's power in you through the Holy Spirit that is actually doing God's word th work through you. Because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. If we are Christian, God lives in us. The Holy Spirit lives in us. And it is His power within us that is doing His work. In other words, in a way, it's he's using us as an instrument. If I play an instrument, and I have about 180 of them in my collection, I am playing the music. I'm doing it through the instrument, but I'm the one that's actually doing the playing. I'm fingering the notes. I'm blowing into the instrument. I'm checking to make sure that it's all right. I'm checking to make sure that its pitch is all right. And I'm doing all kinds of things. The instrument itself is doing the playing because without it, I wouldn't have the music, but I'm the one that's controlling it. I'm controlling how much air that's in it, so I'm controlling the loudness of the sound, or I'm softening down, or I'm changing the pitch. So it, it is, in a way, you see, it's a little bit like that, if I can use that as an example. Um, we are invited to join God to do his work, and some people, if they're invited in a way to see God do his work, they want to see a sign. They want to see a sign that this is what I'm supposed to do. And for that, you see, we don't necessarily have a sign. If God leads us in a certain direction, we follow, but we don't always have a sign. God is not interested in always giving us a sign. We do want to be affirmed by God, and he does affirm us, but he usually affirms us after the work is done. I'm going to read a verse here in Exodus, Exodus 3.12, uh, I'm sorry, Exodus 3.12, and I'm reading it from the NIV version. And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. 
And so what God is saying, I will not give you a sign until after. How do you know that you've done what's right? How do you know? It's one, after you've done it and you see the results of it, and it's at that time you get the affirmation. You don't always get the affirmation before you begin. You follow God, you listen to his direction, you do what you think is right, and then as that process proceeds, you may not be 100% sure that everything you're doing is what God wants, but you probably know at least to a certain degree because of the fact that God leads you and he's not gonna leave you in the lurch. So he does lead you. But what it's saying here is that how do you know that your sign is going to be when you've taken the people out of Egypt and you're worshiping on this mountain. And when that is accomplished, then you know for sure that you have done what it is that God wants. How many people today, if they're working with God, they're doing things that they know that God wants them to do, have absolute certainty of every step that they take that is exactly what God wants? I would say maybe not not many. And yet you have that sense God is, God is leading you and you follow where he's leading you. But the affirmation comes later. When Jesus invited Peter to step out of the boat on the Sea of Galilee, he didn't say, Peter, I know you can do it, do it. Peter said, if it be you, call me. And, and Jesus said, come. Now, uh, um, let me read this verse in Matthew 14, verses 28 and 29. It'll make it clear, and this is from the NIV version. Peter is saying uh, to God, Lord, if it is you, uh, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. Now we all know that Peter took his eyes off Jesus and that he fell into the water and Jesus res rescued him. But, but Peter actually did walk on the water. He walked toward Jesus. What had happened was they were in a boat in the storm and they see Jesus, they see a form. They're not sure who that form is. So Peter's asking the question, if it's really you, then at, tell me to come out on the water toward you. And Jesus simply said, come. There was no, I can't do it, or Jesus saying, I think you can do it if you try and you keep your eyes on me. There was nothing like that. Jesus said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and he walked toward Jesus. And then, of course, he lost his, his grip on the situation and he fell into the water and Jesus spared him. But where's the affirmation? It's after Peter actually steps off the boat into the water. He knows that Jesus, it's Jesus by this time, and he does take some steps on the water before he falls in. So uh, if you have a ministry, if you are a Christian and you have a ministry, how do you know if something happens that you don't like, if it doesn't seem to be going well, how do you know that it's you making a mistake or whether God's trying to prevent you from doing it because you've taken a wrong path, or whether it's just the usual kind of harassment that we get when we try to do something good and Satan works against us. How do you know that? Now that's a difficult question to answer, and I think you have to look at your circumstances, you have to look at the situation, you have to lean on God because he will let you know. He's not going to let you just flounder. He will let you know that you're on the right path, keep going, or maybe you've stepped out of bounds, let's change direction a little, and he can do that for you. He will give you the knowledge that you need to be able to do what it is that he wants you to do. So you don't have to be worried about it, but it is, a, it is a, something that we do struggle with. If we're Christians, how do we know? How was I to know that I was to move up in this area? Well, I, all the signs pointed to it. Everything pointed to it. My personal situation pointed to it. And I just knew I had that inner sense that this was the right thing to do, and I did it. A lot of times, you know, the most difficult situations, the most difficult decisions that you will make will be decisions whether 
it's a good decision either way, so which one is best? In other words, you're not making a decision between what's bad and what's good. You know what's going to be bad, and you know what's going to be good. You're not making a decision like that. You're making a decision of what's good, but what's better. What's good, but what's best? Those are the hardest decisions to make, because no matter what decision you make, it's not, at least on the surface, a bad decision. Now, I saw a pastor once, uh, and I asked him that question because I was struggling with a decision to go to another college to become a college professor in the Midwest or to help a friend of mine start a Christian counseling center. And either one would have been a good decision. As it turned out, I decided, due to the circumstances and everything else that was going on in my life at the time, was to stay and help my friend who was a pastor start a Christian counseling center. At that time, I was not a minister, but he was, and he wanted to have a Christian counseling center, and I had three college degrees in counseling, so I could help him out with it a good deal. And so I decided that it was better for me to stay and help this little tiny fledgling center that he was starting rather than go to an already established university in which they had invited me to be professor of psychology and also to be the director of the department. So I made that decision. And then I wasn't sure, however, that it was the right decision, but I thought it was the right decision. So I talked about it with a friend of mine who was a pastor at the time, and he said, you don't have to worry about it. If you are trying to follow God and doing the best that you can do, and you're not trying to run away, you make the decision on the basis of what you know, the best decision that you can possibly make, and God will make sure that it's the right decision. Now, that's what he told me. And I thought it was interesting at the time. And as it turned out, it was the right decision because from that, I helped to start and was involved with two other counseling centers, one of them my own for over 20 years. And then I became a minister. In that process, I became a minister. And I knew at that point that I had made the right decision. But sometimes it's tricky. Sometimes you're not sure. You have to have have such faith in God that you know he's going to lead you right. And if you do make an honest mistake, he's going to get you back to where you're supposed to be. So you don't have to have a lot of fear about it, but you do have to have a lot of trust. If you're going to be serving God, trust is a must because you don't know what's going to come up for the next opportunity or what you're going to be able to do next. So uh, we have to think that God will, that, that we have to know that God will lead us in the right direction. And we have to know that he's not going to let us slip through the, the tracks. And we know that what he's interested in most of all is to have a relationship with you. The relationship that he has with you is more important than what you do. It is a relationship of love between you and God, and that is what God wants to firmly establish as he leads you on. So if you are unsure of what's going on, you can ask yourself the following questions. You can clarify what God's leading really was. What did God actually say? What did that still small voice in you actually say? And then you let him work out the details in time and you do whatever you have to do and then wait on God until he tells you what to do next and just keep going. You don't have to back down. You just keep going. John 16, verses 12 and 13, and I'm re reading this from the King James, says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit that is lead, leave, living in you will guide you to all truth, and he will do that. And when you respond that way, then he's going to lead you step by step to make sure that you go where it is that you need to go. Ask yourself, am I responding to all God is presently doing in my life and how he's leading me? Have I obeyed what I already know to do? Uh, do I believe that he loves me and he will do what's best for my life? And am I willing to wait on his timing? Because timing is incredibly important. Sometimes we tend to jump ahead when we shouldn't. Sometimes we lag behind when we shouldn't. The timing is important. Now, when Moses 
Moses experienced God's work as he led his people out of Egypt. God invited Moses to work with him in order to release the people from Egypt to the promised land. God told Moses what to do. Moses obeyed, and God delivered the Israeli people through Moses. Moses did a lot of the work, but it was God's power that was in him that did it. And Moses knew God more intimately after that process is over. When Noah obeyed God, God preserved his family. When Abraham obeyed God, God gave him a son. When David obeyed God, God made him king. And when Elijah obeyed God, God sent him fire from heaven. So it's the obeying and trusting God and just following him, which is the most important. And then God will work through you and you can accomplish great and mighty things for him. I'm going to close it here. We're just about out of time, so I'll continue next week. Please join me then.